The next or odds and ends is what kind of controls do I need over inventory? Inventory is one of those things that often has value and might miraculously walk, up, uh, walk off. The key thing that we use to control anything is, is we want separation of duties, which just means have more than one person involved in every transaction. And you just figure people won't work together very long before somebody gets mad and starts telling. We had a auditor from the state of Illinois give a speech. He said, it's amazing how many of uh, their frauds start with somebody coming in saying, my ex did this. So the first thing for authorization of inventory purchases, another key thing that we always do is it's never verbal. It always has to be in writing. Um, you often have what's called a procurement department, which back in the olden days, we used to call that a purchasing department. Job of the purchasing department is just to be that extra person to authorize the purchase. The next thing is the next person involved is the receiving department. And so again, we normally have a set special receiving department that initially checks in the goods. And this is at the kind of I'm going to call this the shipping dock. For the people who meet the truck, if you drive by like the back of a lot of stores, they'll have a sign that says this is the shipping slash receiving department. People receiving cash, and this is a really important one. People receiving cash should be separate from these people. And this is where the accountants come into play. Otherwise, what could happen is if the customer doesn't take the discount, what could the person uh, do with the extra cash? The cash receipts person can just take that extra. And the customer is happy. The company doesn't know any better. And the cash receipts person has that extra discount. Control over damaged and returned inventory. Again, you need to send the damaged goods back or at least have another person who double checks you. At um, the Highland Walmart many years ago, they had a clerk who people would come in and they return a camera, for example. She'd scan the camera and give the person their money back. And then when nobody was around, she'd scan it again and say there was another return and take the cash for herself. Someone needs to verify to compare the credit to the inventory to make sure, because there nobody noticed there was only one camera there and they had returned for two. They did eventually catch it. Lastly, uh, we need to do a periodic count at least once a year because things get mixed up, things get lost, things get stolen. At the end of the year, let's say you do your inventory count and you have missing inventory. And it's a nice term. We sometimes call it shrinkage and put your own joke there. I'm not going there. But what if you do an inventory count and there's only 84 iPads? Remember, we bought 100 and sold 10, so we should have had 90. We only got 84, so six of them mysteriously disappeared. Those were $2.99 each. Um, once we netted it, so if my math is right, at 1794. End of the year, we get our inventory to wherever it needs to be. We just put that into cost of goods sold. It's another cost of having inventory on the shelves is that some of it's going to disappear along the way. Last but not least, we have a formula for how to figure out our cost of goods sold, and it's a pretty easy formula. But it confuses students, and if it ever does, just think through what we're doing. So I'm going to do your economics class, because that's larger than this one. Say there were 100 students enrolled in the beginning of the semester. 
15 added the class. I know when people add, but I never know when people drop. At the end of the semester, uh, the instructor gives out 96 grades. Take a minute and figure out how many students have dropped the class, how many moved on. Hopefully you came up with 19 and you probably came up with it a bunch of different ways. We have a formula to do it, but if you can do it in your head, that's fine too. Well, I'm gonna start with this way. So we have beginning, we had a hundred. We added 15, gives us the 115. That was kind of like available to finish the class. We ended with, 96, so we know those didn't move on. So that means that 90 moved on. And that's exactly what we're gonna do for cost of goods sold, where this is gonna be your beginning inventory. These would be your purchases. That's what you add in. This is available to sell. This is your ending inventory. And in cost of goods sold, the things that moved on were your cost of goods sold. Those were the items that moved from here to the customer. If you ever forget the formula, just think about what you're doing. I've got 5,000 units in beginning inventory. And here we're using costs instead of units, especially in um, the next accounting class. You use this a lot, and sometimes you use units, and sometimes you use costs. Is my 5,000. I purchased 200,000. So my available for sale is 205. Uh, we do our physical count. Our ending inventory is 17,000. Our cost of goods sold is 188. That's all there is to it.